All right. So why is type 0 going undetected? This was originally from a, from a talk called Rootkits are lame, but defenders are worse. And so it's talking about the fact that you know, rootkits don't use necessarily, a lot of the things in the wild don't use particularly advanced techniques. But because defenders, other than yourselves, who are now learning them, because defenders don't know these techniques, they just you know, go hidden when they should be easily detected. All right, so why are type 0 going undetected? Well, that's just your typical, you know, overinvestment in blacklisting. If an attacker comes out with something new and they're using it for a very focused, targeted attack, there's no reason that that's ever going to be necessarily submitted to antivirus and therefore not going to help you out. And also, whitelisting is sort of underutilized in my, um, in my opinion. But I think the reason it's underutilized is because you know, historically, the level of effort associated with each was that, you know, blacklisting antivirus, you buy it, you install it, you're essentially outsourcing the knowledge about your systems, right? You're saying, hey, AV company, it's your job to tell me what's good and bad, right? Whitelisting, it kind of has to be an in-source kind of thing. You have to have administrators who are keeping track of, you know, changes throughout the corporation where, uh, you know, they're responsible for saying, is this good, is this bad? You know, that running down all of those changes and determining are those malicious or not, that's definitely a lot of effort. I, I feel that, you know, it's really more of a front-loaded effort, and that's kind of what keeps people out. It's like the, the magnitude of, you know, take a corporation of 7,000 people and figure out what should and shouldn't be there, especially when we're starting from, you know, messy systems, right? It's a lot easier if you start from, you know, for all new images that we pass out, we have them whitelisted. But if we try to, like, take everyone's existing system with all their miscellaneous installed, that's certainly front-loaded effort, but I think it's entirely tractable when you know people get tired of dealing with the exponential growth in malware, right? So there's plenty of uh, data from AV companies that say, you know, the number of malicious. It's mostly due to polymorphism and not due to like people making completely new families in malware, but due to polymorphism, the fact that they just you know run something through a packer, they get a new thing that bypasses AV signatures, and that's you know one new thing on the AV's chart of uh, unique samples found, right? They just kind of take an MD5, and if it's different, they call it unique. And they're showing that there's sort of exponential growth. So at some point, hopefully, defenders will feel that it's not worth trying to play catch up with exponential growth and rather just go with the linear growth that is the uh, number of software variants that we have on our internal systems. That's why I took a data with that. Um, so type 1 malware, going back to the taxonomy, we said type 1 malware is something which changes data which should be static. So this is data that should not be changing, but it's getting changed anyways. So most in the wild root kits kind of fall in this uh, type 1 category or type 2. They're changing stuff that should be static or they're changing some stuff that should be dynamic. Hmm. All right, so here's just a quick glimpse and we'll, we'll come back to all of these uh, in their own time. But, uh, but this is an example of the import address table book. We actually saw this in the Life of Binaries class. And so the point is, you've got some code in your binary. Uh, can we go up to the, um, sorry, Bill, can we go up to the uh, vectors? Maybe gesticulating. Thank you. So the point is, you've got some binary here. In, in the Life of Binaries class, it was TaskManager.exe. TaskManager.exe is going to go out and try to find a list of the currently loaded processes, right? So it's called like uh, ZW query information or something like that. NT query information, let's say. I don't remember the exact function. So there's some code which is going to call an imported function NT query information. Somewhere inside that binary, there is an import address table, which is just a big list of function pointers to those things which are imported from DLLs. So NT query information was imported from, I think, ntdll.dll. So normally the way it would work is task manager calls NT query information, and it calls it indirectly through this function pointer. So, so it says call and whatever function pointer is here. And that would normally point at NT query information in ntdll.dll. But in that class, we had installed a DLL. We had injected a malicious DLL where it went in and it changed the import address table and it redirected it to the attacker's code. The attacker then called the original and the original returned to the attacker's code and he then filtered out 
any processes he didn't want them to see. So it just it filtered calc.exe. So task manager would never see calc because this code called that code, and then it filtered the result and sent back the results to the original code. And so we're going to come back to this notion uh, at the end of this slide deck in that you can think of a lot of the especially static manipulations. <coughs> You can think of a lot of the type 1 malware techniques as sort of men in the middle attacks on the host. So it's because the attacker is able to interpose here on what should have been a call, you know, straight up to that code. He's men in the middle, it's redirecting to the attacker up to that and back down. So whereas, you know, plenty of people are familiar with network based men in the middle attacks and, you know, the fact that the capabilities that that gives the attacker, uh, here you can see this is one of uh, many ways that by changing static information, the attacker can met in the middle. And so the import address table specifically it's static information because we said in life binaries, you double click on an executable, the OS puts it into memory, fills in the import address table with all the functions that you asked for, and then that's done. That should never ever change again. It's just filled in. But if it changes, if an attacker comes in and redirects it, then you know that's something which a defender can come along and look for. And so we'll see some of our tools show that type of change later. All right, so SSDT is the System Service Descriptor Table. <clears throat> on Windows, like on uh, other operating systems, the kernel typically exports some set of functions to user space because the kernel is the one who's going to access all the hardware. Um, you know, that's kind of the thing that, uh, the kind of one of the points of uh, kernel separation is to say, okay, I'm the kernel, I'm now in charge of mediating all access to hardware. <clears throat> User space programs you're you're required to go to me, and so on Linux or, or you know, Mac or Windows, there's like a system call table is what you'd see it called on Linux, and and this type of attack existed in Linux systems before people got around to making you know rootkits for for Windows that used kernel separation. So the point is there's some list of functions that the kernel exports things like ZW create file. <coughs> so in order to access the file system, you're accessing, you know, hard drives, so you're accessing hardware. So user space code may not just go out and write to the file system. User space code must call some function to talk to the kernel, and the kernel then goes and accesses the file system and sends back in. And so how this works is normally there's something like the user would just uh, a user space program would just see this called like create file. Create file would eventually redirect to something like ntdll.dll again, which would call into the kernel. The kernel then has a big array of different uh, function pointers for different things that it's exporting to user space. In this case, specifically, uh, before you call to the kernel, this thing said it set up EAX with hex 25, and that uh, the convention that most of the OSs use is that just EAX is EAX register is the index that you're asking for in terms of uh, in this array of different functions here. So that's why this is hex 25 here. So you set it up and say, I want to call function hex 25, which this code just knows corresponds to great file. It calls function x25, and normally this function pointer would point up here at the NT kernel proper. So that's where the implementation is usually done for the great file. But again, the attackers come in, replace the function pointer, redirects it to himself. Maybe he goes up to there, maybe he doesn't. But he's basically man in the middle of this call to a uh, kernel function. And the alternative to that, it's the same thing, just a different place to man in the middle, is that, okay, well, then, you know, some defenders come in and they say, aha, I'll look for, you know, changes to the system's service descriptor table. But instead of changing that, you can instead let it go to the original code. But then this, he does what's called an inline hook, where inline in the actual code that would be the implementation for that function, he puts a jump instruction, which just immediately jumps to the attacker code. He does whatever he's going to do. He takes the instructions that he overwrote in order to put in that jump instruction. He executes those before he's done, and then he just jumps back and executes the rest of the code. So just another way to man in the middle, and when it's an inline hook, you're actually overwriting existing code, and you, you copy the code that you overwrite because you still need to execute that eventually. But in the case of inline hooks, the attacker has to be able to, for instance, disassemble the target. He knows that, for instance, his jump instruction is five bytes long, so he says, I need to copy, you know, at least five bytes of code, but really I need to, you know, stop on boundaries of, you know, instruction granularity. So in this case, you get lucky in that this is two bytes, one byte, two bytes, 
And that, those three instructions just happen to correspond exactly to five bytes. And so we just need to copy three instructions. If, for instance, these uh, three instructions correspond to seven bytes or something like that, he only wants to write five bytes. But if the instructions correspond to more bytes, he's got to copy all the instructions and then, you know, just put in some no-ops, so jump, no-op, no-op, or something like that. I think we'll see an example of that later. <coughs> if I open up the cafe example, I can't because I don't know that. All right. So these are all just examples of something that shouldn't be changing. So in these first two things, IAT hook, SSD key hook, these were both cases where there's a, a table of function pointers which gets set up once and it never changes again after that. If an attacker comes in and changes it, he can man in the middle, but a defender can come in and say that should not be changing. Same thing here for uh, code that's not just memory with, with some small exceptions where there's polymorphic code. Uh, typically, code that gets mapped into memory is static, it's marked as non-writable, and therefore it should never be changing again. But an attacker can just mark it as writable, go in and put a jump instruction. So you can also compare that, uh, that static code in memory to an expectation that you have based on the file on disk. And then you can say, well, someone changed this code in memory. All right, so that, those were some static things. This is another static thing, actually. So the master boot record, uh, the boot kit, uh, is just the infection of the master boot record. This is sort of the overall process by which um, a system boots. So I said you start with the BIOS. I can't reach that, so I'm not even going to go up there and point at it. So you start with the BIOS, right? And I said when the BIOS is fully done, that it goes in and reads the first sector of the hard drive, which is the master boot record. Puts that into memory and just, you know, jumps into it and lets it start executing code. All right, then the master boot record eventually loads up the partition bootloader. So at the beginning of each partition, then there's some more code. The thing is, the master boot record is basically static. Uh, there's these little partition things at the bottom, but the master boot record itself in terms of code, there's a specific version for Windows XP in 2000, specific version for Vista, and I think a specific version for Win 7. And for a given Windows OS, that version is not actually changing within revisions or anything like that. So pretty much, if you can read the master boot record, you can, you know, look at the expectation of what it should be, <coughs> and you can say whether or not it's good. Now, the thing is, if there's a boot kit installed on the system, then what they're going to try to do, right, so if they're trying to hide themselves, then when you go, what, what the actual in the wild ones do is that when you go try to read the master boot record, they're intercepting that file uh, access, the, actually not even file access, the hard drive level access, so when you go out and say, you know, I want to read sector zero from the hard drive, they intercept that and they redirect it to a copy of the clean master boot record and then they give you back the clean copy and you look at it and you say, okay, yeah, that looks good to me. Right? So that's, uh, when they start at the master boot record, they sort of hop their way, so that's what I haven't talked about yet. They start there and then when the partition bootloader is loaded into memory, they're intercepting that because they're intercepting the actual file access. Even back at the master boot record level because they're putting in a hook into the interrupt descriptor table in real mode, which we talked about in um, the immediate x86. So at, when you're in real mode, when you're at the very beginning of the uh, boot process, you use the interrupt descriptor table to send uh, queries to the, to the hard drive. And so when you're getting it back, it's basically checking the data as it's coming back. And it's saying, okay, does this look like you know, the partition loader or NG boot loader or the OS loader. So at some later phase, I think it's the either the OS loader phase or the win load phase, it's looking for a string. It's saying, did you just load winload.exe? If so, then they still inject their code into that so that when finally the NG kernel gets loaded, they can still be, you know, intercepting. It gets loaded and then they scribble all over it and then they say, okay, go ahead, kernel, start. So they basically can hop their way along these phases so that they can compromise each phase before it actually starts executing code so that ultimately they can compromise the kernel before it even starts. And the reason, therefore, why you need to potentially work around something like TrueCrypt or PointSec is if you're just intercepting the data when it comes back from the hard drive, but if there's a full hard drive encryption thing, you're going to be getting a double data, right? You're going to be getting encrypted data. So that's why they would, for instance, need to you know, put an inline hook into the partition bootloader so that after the thing decrypts the data, you know, when it's sitting there with a decrypted buffer, 
then it wants it to call back to its code, and then it wants to, you know, search for signatures and stuff like that. So that's uh, basically a master boot record. Like I was saying, it's supposed to be static. How it basically works is it bounces between those phases, eventually leading up to the kernel, so that it can, you know, scribble all over each phase before it actually gets uh, control of the CPU, so that it still holds control of the overall boot process. All right, so detecting type 1, again, type 1, things that, um, things that change stuff that shouldn't change. So my favorite was Gmer, but here comes a new challenger. Like I said, Virus Block 8 are the people who found Stuxnet, a Russian company. Um, and so I think that, you know, they, they have like a beta out right now that adds some extra stuff, and, and I really like it because it has a lot more stuff, so. so I do the show you See, it's mostly all about uh, embarrassing my wife. She saw me the other day, like, on the video, shouting, you know, this is intermediate x86, stuff like that. So, the important thing is she just cringes, and one's for you, honey. All right. So, we are still, so, like I said, I found VBA, like, Friday before the uh, Monday class. So, the, the, the class notes are still built around Gmer, and, but I will, you know, at appropriate times show that Gmer can't actually roll back this change that's installed VBA and, uh, and show how we can remove stuff. But there's all these different things, Toluca, Gmer, things like that. Some of you found these tools by Googling, some of you didn't. But, you know, had you stumbled upon something like Gmer, you would have found, you know, that many more results because uh, it looks in more places than some of the other stuff. Uh, and then, like I said, these are reused slides, so some of them are... Um, Shoutouts or reference or whatever you want to say. Some of them are just uh, talking about some academic work because I was giving the talk at Purdue, and so I was like, oh yeah, and those Purdue guys, they made VM watchers. Uh, VM Watcher would be something where, for instance, if you're trying to detect wing zero things, you just go to level wing, neg wing negative one, and you see everything that happens within the OS, right? So you're outside of the system looking in, and you can detect those changes because as long as you assume that the virtualization barrier holds up, then the attackers in the guest OS, you're outside of it, and they can't mess with you, but you can mess with them. So that's basically what VM Watcher does. Microsoft had a thing called Strider Ghostbuster where uh, he was trying to look for things specifically hiding their files, and he was using what's called cost detection, where the point is, you look at something from two different perspectives, and so in this particular case, uh, what you could do is you could say, you know, just give me a listing of all the stuff on the file system, and then boot into a boot disk, and then give me a listing again, so like a Linux boot disk that understands NTFS. The Linux boot disk is not going to be under the control of the boot kit, necessarily. Uh, but, you know, typically the way the attacker is hiding is if they're in the OS, you know, intercepting all those file system reads, well, when you boot into, you know, a Linux OS, they're not intercepting the file reads. So you get the clean view from the boot disk, you get the dirty view from within the OS, you dip the results, and then you say, okay, you know, anything that shows up in the Linux, via, in the Linux uh, boot disk that didn't show up inside, that means there is a rootkit hiding this file, right? And actually, someone, you'll see when I distribute the anonymized uh, write-ups, someone did actually go to this level and they used like a Nopix CD where they booted from the CD and they did a file system view from inside and outside. So they essentially did the equivalent of what Ghostbuster did, which is fine because Ghostbuster never actually got released. So uh, in terms of, so that was detecting type 1, so we're going to cover a bunch of that in this class anyways. In terms of preventing type 1, well, there's something called patch guard or kernel patch protection, which is a technique built into Windows X64. And the point of it is that they are looking sort of for those static things, these type 1 things, and built into the operating system is checks where when it gets started up, it will, for instance, it initializes the SSD key, and then it takes, you can think of it as taking a hash of it, and it stores the hash somewhere hidden where it's obfuscating what's going on. And then they periodically check the SSD key and if it ever changes from that first clean hash, then they just immediately blue screen the system. Right, so they do that for things like the code. So, so essentially they're doing it for things like this. Just saying, 
uh, check the entire SSDT, and if it ever changes, blue screen the system. So one, to some degree, it's the people on the phone. Check the SSDT, and if it changes, blue screen the system. To some degree, that's to check through kits and stuff like that. To a larger, I think, degree, it's to get third-party software off of these unsupported ways of doing things, where you know, because blue kits hook the SSDT, but so do a bunch of security software and other, you know, legitimate programs, as you may have noticed in your homework VM, you go and you look at a bunch of changes, and some of them look like they're associated with, you know, zone alarm and uh, trustier rapport and uh, what else was in there? Daemon tools, stuff like that, right? Microsoft is, you know, saying these are not the supported mechanisms. We're giving you APIs. If our APIs are insufficient, come and work with us and stuff like that. So if you look, you you can go find articles like when they first came out with PatchGuard where all the antivirus companies were up in arms saying, you know, how can we check for, you know, viruses if we can't, you know, intercept all the file system access and registry access and stuff like that. But, uh, but Microsoft eventually came out with, you know, more robust APIs to do the types of things that they need to do in order to detect. And so they're really trying to push people away from these unsupported things. So they're saying, look, security software, stop changing that table. That should be fixed. Stop changing putting jump instructions in the middle of, you know, my kernel, you know, that should not be changing. And so if you do that, then it moves free. So they check, like, IDT, GDT, static code, SSDT, stuff like that, and they functionally take a hash at when they first set it up, and then because they know it should never change again, if they come back around later, they just sort of periodically check. And uh, if it's changed, you get a blue screen. And so that's a good way to push the... Uh, tools away from using those sort of mechanisms. Now, that said, like I said, there's some level of root detection capability for that, but maybe that's insufficient because things like boot kits, because they boot up, because they start up before the entire operating system starts, there's in the wild boot kits, in the TDSS root kit, um, it's something that supports X64 systems, it installs to the master boot record. It hops its way along the thing. And the first thing it does before the operating system starts is so the operating system is loaded into memory. They go search it. And they say, you know, I'm going to disable the checks for signed code. So the checks which force you to, to have uh, signed drivers. And I'm going to disable patch guard. So patch guard doesn't start up. And then signed drivers don't, drivers don't have to be signed. So then they can just use all the same mechanisms that they would use on a non-patch guard system. And so that sort of, like I said, pushes attackers, in some cases, it pushes attackers to type zero where they maybe just want to hide in, in plain sight. In other cases, they're maybe going to change just dynamic stuff. In this case, uh, the attacker is still a type one attacker. He's still just changing the master boot record, which shouldn't be changed. But because he's there before the operating system even starts, you know, he wins. So just turn it off. That's what he does. All right, and um, Nickel, again, was just a reference to some academic work, which was uh, using virtualized system in order to validate all of the uh, loads to memory so that, you know, if this is something which we don't expect loading kernel module, then uh, it disallows it. All right, so why are type 1 going undetected? Well, so I gave you a bunch of list of a bunch of things like Gmer and VBA and stuff like that, right? So if... I'm saying, you know, this is one of the main reasons why rootkits are lame. They're just changing stuff that's easily detectable that it shouldn't be changed. Why is it still going undetected? Well, one of the problems is that the software like Gmer and VBA, these are things which are meant to be run on single standalone systems, and you'll, you'll sort of see that as we use them. It's got a GUI interface. Most of them don't have command line version where it just, you know, spits out to standard out. The, the VBA people say they are working on a command line version, so that'll be good because it's a good detector and potentially you could drop it to a system, spit it out to command line, and, you know, just pull back the result. But most of this stuff is meant to be run, you know, go double click and click around tabs and stuff like that. So that doesn't exactly lend itself to enterprise use, right? It's really more like a home user, but the problem is the home users aren't really going to understand the results, right? So more like a forensics guy is coming in and, like, you know, he really knows what he's looking for and he's got like a VM version of the system he's captured looking. So, so that's this bullet point too is that the best detectors, the ones we're going to talk about here, you need this level of, you know, multi-day class in order to even really understand what they're trying to tell you about what changed. 
So that's part of what this is trying to address is that, you know, at least now you'll have uh, the level of knowledge that you can understand what it's trying to say. So at such point, then the rootkit hiding becomes quite shallow. All right, so any questions on type 1 before I go on quick? Again, those are just changes stuff that shouldn't be changed. We're going to go into each of the ex exact techniques later, but any general questions about this? Anyone on the phone have any questions? Anyone who show up? No. All righty. So, type 2 malware. So, type 2, like we said, was changes things which are potentially dynamic. Uh, these are things which are meant to be changing. And so, the, the most common example of this is direct kernel object manipulation, or DCOM. And this refers to techniques where the attacker goes in and they're not using any sort of API, but instead they're understanding how the OS uses data structures. And they go in and manipulate the fields of those data structures directly. And so this was, this technique was developed by Jamie Butler specifically to avoid the fact that, you know, he saw that, okay, yeah, I can hide files by hooking a specific entry in, you know, the ZW open file or whatever it is, some specific entry in the SSDT. But he knew that that was eminently detectable if anyone actually wanted to go look at the SSDT. They'd say, this should be pointing at NTOS kernel.exe. It's not, you know, that's bad. Let's alert on it. And so he came up with this technique, DCOM, in order to still be able to do things like, well, I guess in this case he wasn't hiding files. There's more things like hiding processes or hiding uh, loaded drivers or hiding DLLs and stuff like that. So he came up with it by, by going in, reverse engineering the way that the OS was using uh, its process lists. And he found that there was a discrepancy in terms of that there were lists of processes which were used by something like Task Manager. But that was not the same list of processes that's used by the OS scheduler to actually run stuff. So that meant you could remove stuff from the list that Task Manager looks at, but it would still get scheduled by the OS and it would still run. So I'll show a picture of that in a second. Uh, and then also kernel object hooking is sort of like a subcategory of DCOM, but it's also one of the ones which is uh, much harder to detect. So kernel object hooking is that you know the data structure again. You, you want to go in and directly modify a data structure. But you have a data structure where it has a function pointer in it. It's something where maybe there's a callback. You create a structure and you put in a little function pointer that says, you know, you're, you're throwing it over to some other component of the system. And you say, okay, when you're ready, call me back at this address. And so you're, you're embedding that function pointer in there. And so uh, if an attacker knows that these objects have these function pointers in them, they just go in and they change the function pointer the same way they did with the import address table or the SSDT or anything else. So it's really just kind of the same notion of if I control a function pointer, I can point it at my attacker function instead of the legitimate one. But, uh, but doing it on some object which is potentially ephemeral, popping in and out of the existence. All right, so this is the, the canonical example of DCOM, and it's related to process hiding. So in the, um, in the kernel, there's various data structures you can follow. So there's this KPRC. Matthew, remember what this is? It's kernel process register control block, or what's the R? I can't remember the R. It's, it's like a, uh, it's basically a sort of kernel control data structure that has a bunch of information. And uh, one of the fields is the current thread, which is going to be pointing at a specific K thread uh, structure. And so it's worth saying that, you know, I said there's a discrepancy in the list of what gets scheduled versus what gets, you know, reported by something like Task Manager. Uh, Windows and other OSs like Linux, they tend to schedule things at the thread granularity. And I mean, really that makes sense because, uh, you know, you may have a process and it may have multiple threads in it, right? But Someone's got to say, okay, you thread stop now, you thread go, right? So, and that's the kernel. So across all the processes, there's potentially many threads within a process, but it's the kernel's job to say, okay, you've had enough time, it's time for this next thread to run. You've had enough time, it's time for the next thread to run. And so there's a list that the kernel uses of threads in order to, to do things. But there's also this list of structures called e-process structures. And this is the list actually which uh, 
This is the list from which data is taken in order to report what processes are running when you run task list or uh, task manager or anything else like that, or even process explorer. Um, it's actually, when you, it calls a function like ZW query information. That goes into the kernel. It walks this list because you can see that, you know, we've got a linked list here where every e process is linked to every other e process. So when you call a certain API, it goes in, walks that list, you know, pulls the name field out of each of them, and then returns it back to say, here's my list of processes, and here's all of their process IDs and stuff like that. All right, so in a DCOM attack here where you're trying to hide a process, what you do is essentially just unlink a process from that list. So because we know that the, the kernel is not like running around looking at e-process structures, the kernel is looking at thread structures, which, you know, bear some relation to this, but are not directly, you know, applying to this list. So all the attacker has to do is go in, you know, walk this chain, you know, start up here, go to that structure, find this structure, go to that, and then for whatever he wants to take out, he just says, okay, well, your forward link may have, you know, used to point, to, well, he doesn't actually have to change this, more like, for this process right here, he says, okay, whereas your forward link used to point to this one in the middle, now I'm going to point your forward link to this third one here, right? So you used to point at the next one, but instead, point over it to that. And the third one, it used to point back to the middle one, but instead, point back to first one. And so you're essentially unlinking these things. I have to move your bike because every time you turn to the screen, you're ah. feeding out so yeah. <laughs> yep. So basically, you know, in this DCOM attack, the attacker just says, here's a link list. I know that removing this E process from this is not going to stop the process from running. So I can just remove this and it will stop it from showing up in task manager. And the only way the attacker can know that is by going in and reverse engineering and seeing how stuff works. And that's why it's direct kernel object modification because he goes in directly. He has to understand what the OS is normally doing and then how he can manipulate that. And this sort of, this unlinking is the most common form of DCOM. There's, he also talked about things like uh, um, privilege escalation type things where you can say, you, if you know this is the uh, the data structure that holds your privileges for your process, you could just you know set it to maximum privilege. That's another case of you know directly modifying a uh, kernel data structure. But I just I'm not going to talk so much about that because that's less related to, to the hiding side of things, right? So this is more where you definitely are hiding something here, but but there's other things like privilege escalation which are tangentially related. All right, and so then kernel object hooking, this was uh, described by Greg Hoglund, and like I said, it's basically, uh, can we go up to the board? So you've got some data structure here, and it's got a definition. And this particular one is called a KDPC, or a kernel, uh, well, kernel deferred procedure call. And so inherent in the name is it's a deferred procedure call saying, I want to call this function, but I want to call it later. And so these DPC structures are used when, you know, the pro when, well, these are used, for instance, in interrupt handling. So we didn't dig down into how Windows <coughs> specifically does interrupt handling in, you know, the, the intermediate classes or anything like that. But uh, because when an interrupt happens, the uh, interrupt will, it will typically mask off other interrupts. It'll say, we did talk about that a little bit. We talked about interrupt masking, and we said, when this interrupt occurs, it's stopping other interrupts from occurring. And so you really want that interrupt handling code to do whatever it has to do as quick as it can, and then, you know, be done and let the system continue execution. So one of the things it typically does on Windows is it says, all right, I'm going to read in whatever information I need to from the buffer. Let's say you get an interrupt for, from the network card saying, I've got a packet, right? The network card has buffered the packet data. It sends an interrupt to the CPU. The CPU's interrupt handler handles it, and then it says, okay, I know that I need to go out to the, the um, I need to allocate some memory for this new packet that came in. I'm going to go get that data from the NIC card. I'm going to copy it into this, uh, this data structure. But then I don't need to, like, go, you know, pass this to all the applications right now. I'm in interrupt mode, and I'm stopping the CPU from doing anything right now. So instead of, you know, continuing to process it, I'm just going to copy that data into buffer. I'm going to create a KDPC, a deferred procedure call, and I'm going to say, all right, 
Just put this on this list of things that should be called later and call me back at this specific deferred routine later. And when that deferred routine gets called, then I'll go ahead and I'll process, you know, this packet and I'll send it down to the user space application or whatever. So these DPCs are essentially, you know, popping in and out of existence. When an interrupt occurs, this thing gets put onto a chain, a list of a bunch of DPCs that are on the system. But if the attacker has a way of like interposing on, for instance, the insertion into that list of DPCs, he can say, oh, okay, I can see that, you know, this network code is going to go process this packet later on. And so he can put in his own uh, function pointer here and he can say, I want to have the first shot at processing that packet. And then he processes the packet and he says, oh, hey, that's my packet. I'm going to be done with that. And then I'm not even going to call the original guy. So he can call the original guy or he cannot. But, uh, but by being able to, you know, if the attacker has some way to actually, you know, modify these things before they're processed, then, you know, he can intercept things and stop things from happening. I believe there's also an attack based around that patch guard that has something to do with this. Like, so I said patch guard periodically checks to see if stuff is still in a good state. I think it uses DPCs in order to, like, queue up saying, like, you know, I'm going to check this later. So it puts a thing that says, you know, call patch guard check IDP or something like that. And I think there's an attack where the attacker comes in, he intercepts this, puts in his own thing and says, okay, just stop patch guard from even ever checking. But so that's one example, and at the very end, I don't know if we'll ever, if we'll have enough time, but if we don't, there's some optional material at the very end of the slides, which you can check out, where I talk about a couple other types of kernel object hooking. Uh, a couple of which are actually in the wild. I found references to how they're being used by various rootkits, and I wasn't, uh, I wasn't aware that those were in use in the wild right now. So. <coughs> All right, so. So those were type 2 type things like DCOM or maybe you're manipulating things, removing stuff from lists in order to hide stuff or kernel object hooking where you're going in and again just redirecting function pointers to, to point at the attacker code. Alright, so how do you detect this type of attack? Well, in the case of this canonical DCOM hiding processes, hiding drivers, stuff like that, uh, you use techniques again like Cross-view detection is what we call it generically when you just look at something from one perspective and you look at it from another. So we talked about Go, uh, Strider Ghostbuster looks at the file system from two different perspectives. Um, you can look at, you know, the running processes from two different perspectives as well. So, for instance, you could look at it from the thread level, right? You could say, here's all the threads and, oh, hey, I see there's some threads that aren't associated with any process in that e-process list. Maybe that's suspicious. There were other things uh, like Blacklight, which is one of the earlier things that was looking for um, become attacks. And it had done stuff where it actually did a, a brute force over all of the pro possible PID, uh, PIDs, process IDs. It just tried to open PID on every single PID possible. And so if it succeeded, then it would say, okay, here's my list of processes. Based on everything I'm able to open, that's my list of processes. Based on calling, you know, it wasn't actually calling that ZW query information, it was calling another equivalent function, but just call the operating system to get the list of functions. That's my second list, and then compare those two lists, and wherever they differ, that means there's a hidden process. So it turned out that, at least in Blacklight's case, because of this, uh, this PID brute forcing, it worked because there was actually this other table that it was implicitly using behind the scenes, uh, a table that essentially had a single handle per PID, and so the original a few rootkit which did this decom attack, it didn't know about that table and it didn't remove the entries from that table. And so that's why, why Blacklight could go ahead and open up a handle to a process even though it has been unlinked from that e process list. But then uh, uh, Peter Silverman? Peter Silverman, another person came along and improved uh, the FU rootkit in order to recognize that, okay, the reason Blacklight works is because Behind the scenes, the opening process actually consults this little table of handles for every process. So he comes in and he removes it from that as well, so that no longer will this PID brute force work. And then he has to play some other tricks to do it. But, but then that was, you know, a back and forth where eventually this FU kit would uh, be hidden. But, but there's still other ways like checking all the threads and stuff like that. Or you can... Uh, we talked about in the intermediate class the notion of page faults and stuff like that. We said when you run out of physical memory, right, you take some physical memory and you swap it to disk. Right, so that's your swap on Linux and stuff like that, or you page it to disk. 
you can take an intercept on that function which moves data in and out from disk to memory. And you know, when you see data being moved out to disk and you see someone was executing there, you can say, I've got executable code here, but that doesn't correspond to any of my processes. So maybe there's a hidden process, or maybe there's you know just a hidden thread or something like that. So there's various ways you can use cross-view detection to look from two different ways instead of just consulting your one e process list. And like we said, you know, you, you really, with cross-view detection, you want to go with something that's as invariant as possible. So in the file system case, we said, look, the rootkit hides the files from within the Windows OS. But when you boot up to a clean Linux system where you know it's, you know, built from a clean state, they're not, unless they're, you know, hooking the master boot record or something else where they're really early, the invariant there is that, you know, this should be a clean thing and you shouldn't be able to hide your files when you're booted into a Linux CD, but you can from the other. So that's kind of, you know, that should always detect it. Similar thing, like we said, in order for the process to get any, you know, the thread to get any time on the CPU, it must be in that scheduler list, right? So that's sort of an invariant thing where, yes, they can hide themselves from other things like e-process, but they're always going to be in the scheduler list in order to uh, get time to run. Now, I say that and for the people who watch this on the internet, eventually they'll say, no, what about that other thing? I know about that other thing, but we're not talking about it. So there's one talk where someone actually makes their own sort of scheduling system above and beyond what the OS does. All right. So there are plenty of things which will still detect things hidden with DCOM and so I did actually use uh, foo -tool. So the one rootkit is called foo or fu, and then so the other one is foo2 or fu2. Um, I used that within the guest VM and I hid one process and one uh, kernel module. But the process I hid was actually like the system process. So that, that kind of shows up very weird in some of these results and that, that causes issues. But it's, it's kind of funny because if you open, say, Process Explorer, Process Explorer has a way that if you click on the system process, it'll show you all the loaded kernel modules. But when I hid the system process, you go into Process Explorer, it just isn't there. You can't even see that. So had people known about that capability of Process Explorer, they would have found themselves befuddled by the fact that they couldn't even click and see the list of loaded kernel modules. But anyways, uh, I'm going to skip the academic stuff there. All right, so why is type 2 going undetected? Well, it's got all the same problems, right? So we're changing stuff which shouldn't be changed naturally. So you've got all the same problems of, you know, you have to have deep system knowledge. You have tools that are not necessarily made for, for broad deployment or distributed deployment, anything like that. And then on top of that, uh, you've got things like kernel object hooking, which even the tools that are out there right now, even the best tools, are not particularly adept at looking at some of these kernel object hooking techniques. And beyond that, with, with either of these type 2 things, you've always got that information asymmetry problem where if an attacker back on his own, you know, system is doing reverse engineering, finding, you know, I want to hide this particular thing, so I'm going to dig, dig, dig into the system and see how it all works and say, aha, there's this trick I can use. Well, with these kind of things, when they're not changing anything static, uh, they know about a trick and you don't know about a trick and no detector knows about the trick and stuff like that. That's kind of one of the areas from which, you know, rootkit hiding comes, right? Knowledge that they have that you don't have and nothing ever looks there. If you knew to look there, you could detect it, but you don't. And so that's why, especially on the kernel object hooking side of things, that is definitely a sort of uh, arms race. Some of this academic stuff can help. I like this uh, Hook Scout paper because it tries to do full system detection of like where all the function pointers are in memory. Uh, but, you know, getting that to the point where it can be practically applied to real systems, uh, it's just not there yet. So. All right, so that was detecting uh, why type 2 are going undetected. Definitely problems with information asymmetry as well as tools just not being up to it. <coughs> All right, so then uh, type 3 malware. I think I can do this. All right, so type 3, we said, is anything which is outside of the operating system. That was how she defined uh, type 3 malware. 
So that pretty much covers all of this ring negative one and below. So again, I said she was originally thinking of this for, for the technique she had come up with at the time for doing a ring made one root kit, but you can see how everything else potentially yields the ability to uh, manipulate the system before it actually even starts. So this is uh, Joanna Rakowska's ring negative one uh, type root kit. It was called blue pill uh, in symmetry with the red pill sort of technique, which I believe we saw in life of binaries. So red pill was that thing which detects whether or not you're currently in a virtualized system out of the matrix, right? So detect whether you're in a virtual system. Blue pill is where you're staying inside the virtual system or you're, you know, forcing someone into the matrix here uh, in this sort of attack. So, and I can't reach that high. I'm going to clear. So, with blue pill, you've got a system running along on this top arrow going vertically saying this is a native operating system. This is just Windows XP running on your desktop right now, right? At some point, the attacker gets onto the system and calls blue pill in order to insert itself into the system. What blue pill does specifically is, in this case, it enables, enables SVM, which is the uh, AMD. So this, this original proof of concept was AMD specific. So it enables the AMD hardware support for virtualization. It prepares a virtual machine control block. This is sort of the data structure that a hypervisor uses in order to virtualize a guest OS system. And then it says, all right, I'm going to start running my own code as the hypervisor. So I've got some code. I want to initialize and set up the hardware support to say, this code right there, that's the hypervisor. And you know, that's my code. I'm the hypervisor now. And then it basically executes this return to return back out to the guest OS. And so it set itself up so that it's the hypervisor and your guest OS is now being controlled by the hypervisor. You've got this VM control block saying, you know, this memory is guest OS now. This memory is hypervisor now. And so it returns back to the operating system. The operating system executes as normal. You know, it thinks everything's the same way it always was, but Blue Pill has now set itself up to interpose on certain operations you know, maybe it wants to see CPU ID things, maybe it wants to see timestamp things, whatever it wants to check, you can potentially intercept actions that are current inside the guest OS. And your, you know, your system looks no different, right? There's no you know, VMware interface to control it and stuff like that. It's just a hidden hypervisor that's controlling the guest OS. Your guest OS can't read its memory or anything like that. That's kind of the point. The hypervisor is supposed to be isolated from the guest OS, right? You're not supposed to be able to attack the hypervisor or escape the hypervisor or anything like that. So it in inserts this isolation barrier between itself and the guest OS so that, you know, ostensibly you're not able to detect it at this point. Um, well, I, I want to skip right to detecting and then I'll go back. So, Due to there being a lot of, you know, due to some people feeling this was overhyped and that she was claiming that the, um, she was claiming that, you know, as long as Intel and AMD have implemented the hardware support for virtualization properly, then there should be no way to detect that I'm virtualizing the system. But, you know, a lot of people came out then with, you know, papers, this um, Intel Joanna other virtual loop is dead and especially this compatibility is not transparency. Uh, the fact that you can install, you know, the support for virtualization, it's meant to be compatible. It's meant to make the guest OS work the same way that it always works. You know, it's supposed to be transparent to the guest OS, but it's not transparent in the sense that the guest OS can never find out that it's in the hypervisor. I mean, she kind of showed that with Red Pill. You know, she showed, I'm within a hypervisor, or I'm virtualized right now. I can detect it through, you know, quirks and foibles of the system. Now, that particular one she detected could have been fixed so that you can't use it. And there's like a whole bunch of little tricks that you can use, but most of them can pretty much be fixed. But uh, both of these papers basically focused on um, using timing side effects on the system in order to detect it. So whereas, yes, the rootkit can, you know, intercept your act activity within the guest OS, but that's going to take some amount of time and then it's going to let the guest OS resume. Well, 
in the simplest possible case, you know, you could just do something like an RDTSC instruction that we learned in the uh, intermediate x86 class. We said that's the timestamp counter tells you how many ticks of the CPU have occurred, right? And you could say, well, on my normal, you know, whatever it is, 14 duo with, you know, 3 gigahertz, I know that a CPU ID instruction should take, you know, 100 ticks or something like that. And so you do a CPU ID instruction and you see it's coming back with like 400 ticks. Well, that's like dramatically more than it should ever take. Maybe there's a hypervisor intercepting things. You can try doing a bunch more things. You know, you run it, you know, a million times. You average the time. And uh, at some point you can get uh, a notion that there is something going on in the system. The timing behavior just uh, doesn't make sense. Now that said, the attacker can intercept that RDTSC and they can say, oh, well, I also know that a CPU ID instruction should take approximately 100, you know, ticks on this system. So I can intercept your RDTSC or your CPU ID and I can subtract out. So the hypervisor does actually have the ability to manipulate the data coming back from an RDTSC. So it can say however many ticks it wants have elapsed. So there's various back and forths here, but really most of the things ultimately focused on stuff like timing behavior, which the VM can't really intercept every possible source of timing everywhere. You've got external clocks and stuff like that. So ultimately they come down to being detectable. Now, that said, this is a great example of, you know, it's technically detectable, but can people actually detect it in practice? You know, if you want to go out and search for ring negative one widgets today, can you? Well, there's some code that, that says it'll do that, but you know, I've run it on physical systems which I believe are not virtualized. Maybe they're not, but it came back with false positive results. So you know, just because some paper says, you know, hey, yeah, now ring negative one, you know, that's all just no one would use that because it's easily detectable. Well, they can say that, but unless the tools are actually available in practice to put it out there in the wild, um, this type of thing is still going to be really detected. All right, so that was ring native one. This would be ring native two. This is talking about SMM. And I think I used this in the newest version of my intermediate x 6 class, but if you took it last year, you didn't see it. Bill, can we go to the board? Or, sorry, the projector? Bill, can we go to the projector? Mm -hmm. All right, so as with the last class, my joke is I like this. It's a good state machine. It reminds me of either Attack of the Tripods or Batteries Not Included from 1980s, right? It's the flying alien little robot. All right, so the key point here is all roads lead to real mode on reset. So this is just a big state machine. Reset, get you back in real mode. Reset to real mode. Uh, real mode is what your CPU starts up in. This is, you know, a state diagram for the modes of execution for your x86 CPU. Real mode is that 16-bit mode. This is uh, when even the, um, like I said, when the BIOS starts executing, it's, you know, the system just got reset. The first instruction gets pulled from the BIOS. But because the system is reset, it's still in real mode. Eventually, you know, it's, it's the OS loaders or someone else's job in order to set the relevant bits, CR0, control, register 0, uh, protected enable, protected mode enable bit, set it to 1, and that transitions you into protected mode. Now you can, you know, access things like page tables and, well, the page tables will be being used and stuff like that. You've got your ring 0, ring 3, all that stuff. Real mode, protected mode, this is what you saw. This is like what DOS ran in. This is what your uh, OS, your normal Windows or Linux these days runs in protected mode. Or, you know, if it's an x64 system, it runs up in that uh, long mode up there. There's a backwards compatibility. There's full on 64 bit mode, and then there's compatibility mode so that you can still run 32 bit programs even though you have an overall 64 bit operating system. So 64 bit has a backwards compatible mode. Protected mode also sort of has a backwards compatible mode. This virtual 8086 mode, this is sort of backwards compatibility to 16-bit mode, but you don't want to just drop all the way down back to 16-bit mode. So that lets you run, you know, DOS programs from Windows, for instance. That's how it's been used. But then off to the side here, ignored and neglected for many years, is system management mode. But in 2006, uh, I believe you pronounce his name, Louis Deploy, Deploy, I don't know. 
Uh, in 2006, someone showed that you can use system management mode in order to bypass some internal OS controls within OpenBSD. So OpenBSD is a very security conscious BSD distribution. And so they're actually locking down and partitioning memory internally to say, you know, I don't want to allow internal modules to scribble all over everything. But he showed that, you know, if you could get out to system management mode, which circa 2006 you could on some systems because the BIOS wasn't actually locking it down properly. So if he could get out here, he could access all memory everywhere, and that meant he could change the OS as desired. So we consider ring negative 2 more privileged than ring negative 1 because when you get out to SMM, you can actually manipulate all of the physical memory. You can access everything. You know, it's still on you to figure out how to find the data you're caring about manipulating. But you still have full access to everything. And you know, your hypervisor or your OS, no one else, executing in protected mode is allowed to touch your memory, but you're allowed to touch theirs. So then there's been, you know, uh, further um, Invisible Things Lab has found uh, a couple of different bugs in uh, systems which allows them to get into system management mode even when it's locked. So one case was on a particular chipset they can uh, remap some memory space to a different location and they found that they could remap this protected memory into a non-protected virtual address space and, uh, virtual address space and then you know, manipulate it. Or also they found a bug in the CPU where uh, they could mark uh, the SMM mode memory as cacheable and then when an SMI occurred, some of the data would get cached in the CPU. And then on the, there was the bug was that on the you know, next write to that cached data, it would actually uh, sufficiently write it so that when another SMI occurred, then uh, it would allow the modified and written SMM memory to execute, which then the attacker uh, had controlled stuff in SMM at that point. So anyways, like I said, normally the BIOS locks down SMM. You know, earlier, pre-2005-ish is what people have said. Uh, BIOSes were not frequently locking it down appropriately. Post-2005, there's still been bugs found in order to uh, manipulate SMM. <coughs> so, so I wanted to miss. Yeah. So on the preventing and detecting ring negative 2 things, so one thing is that, you know, I said the core issue here that gives SMM uh, access to all of memory, that, that's the core issue. It's more privileged because you can't access its memory, but it can access everything. That said, there's built-in mechanisms uh, in the specifications for hardware support for virtualization, which say, functionally, you can write a little tiny hypervisor which virtualizes the code which runs in SMM. And in that way, that tiny hypervisor can lock down that code and say, no, you're not allowed to scribble all over the hypervisor proper anymore. So at Shmukon, uh last year, I guess, there was a talk where you know, someone from the third party, from Harris, I guess, who used to be at Crucial Screw before they were bought by Harris, um, he just did a talk on how they actually implemented a protection of this, this hypervisor for SMM in order to lock it down so that it couldn't modify the system. And at that point, then it's you know, really deprivileged and it's, you know, theoretically it's not even ring zero anymore. Theoretically then it's just kind of completely containerized and it can't even affect the rest of the system. It should only be talking out to hardware, turning on the fans and that sort of thing. Um, as far as I know though, no one is actually implementing this right now. So for instance, I, you know, the VMware people came through and they gave a talk on, you know, secure virtualization and stuff like that. And I came back with, all right, here's all this documentation of these SMM attacks, which mean that I can, you know, completely scribble over your hypervisor if I want. What are you guys doing to protect against this? And you know, he hasn't been able to find anyone who's willing to say one way or the other, but sounds like the answer is they haven't implemented this uh, SMM transfer monitor or whatever it's called in order to lock down the thing. So, if you have an ESX machine, for instance, on a guest OS, you use the caching bug to get out to SMM, which is just being passed through to the, to the you know, core SMM on the system itself. And then you know, at that point, you can bounce back in and start writing over uh, the 
So theoretically, you know, just on the detection side of things, so this, you know, the prevention side is the isolation, right? So just, you know, quote, just implement this uh, SMM transfer monitor, this isolation <coughs> mechanism, and then, you know, this thing is fully locked down. Or alternatives are, you know, if you're on a system where this isn't available, theoretically, you could just integrity check the SM ramp. But then the question is, how are you actually able to read that SM ramp? And there the answer becomes, you probably have to go lower than the privilege, right? We said if your BIOS is locking it, then you shouldn't be able to get in. So either A, you have to see if your system is vulnerable and go in through the same hole that an attacker would use. Or B, you have to go lower and, for instance, control the BIOS and, you know, maybe put some of your own code into SMM that periodically checks itself or other techniques. So that's SMM. And last <coughs> one, before I let you have your break, uh, is that AMT thing that I talked about before. And so in, uh, this again was Invisible Things Lab, maybe negative three, we did talk, and they found that, you know, like I said, they had found actually one bug which allowed them to get into SMM, this remapping bug where a particular chipset version would allow them to remap memory which should be locked down to non-locked down memory. They found they could use the same bug on this is on an AMT system in order to remap the AMT stuff into uh, its own memory and, and be able to look at it at that point. And so the issue was, you know, the bug had actually been fixed in the sense that there's a patch available that, you know, you can uh, patch the system. But the problem with any of these, like, things where you find an actual bug at the CPU level is in some cases, and typically, you know, microcode updates and CPU patches are pushed out in new BIOS updates. So there's a component of the BIOS where it has a microcode update where you boot the system with the new BIOS. It goes and says, hey, I've got a microcode update. It goes out, talks to the CPU, says, what version is your microcode for your internal operation? And it says, if mine on, you know, the in my BIOS is newer, then I'm going to, you know, reflash the CPU with this update. Um, where was I going with? Mm. Oh, the problem is, even if you flash the CPU with a new update, uh, potentially, and at least in this case, they claim that this was the case, you can go and flash it back to an older version of the BIOS, right? So you can just backflash it in order to put it back into a vulnerable state. So that's really a problem with when these guys found stuff in the actual CPU type thing and the chipsets and problems like that. Uh, you can reflash things back to a vulnerable state. Now, the question is, you know, how do you flash things remotely? And, and that's a different problem. But anyways, um, so in the AMT case, basically the point was, we said the AMT lives in the North Bridge. It's the thing which mediates access to, to all the memory. They found that they could remap memory and analyze and stuff like that. They found there was some code which would periodically get executed even when AMT was technically not enabled according to the BIOS. So in the BIOS, you turn on AMT or turn off AMT. And they found that even when that was not enabled, even when AMT was not enabled, the subcomponent of the chipset code was still being executed periodically by like a timer interrupt or something like that. And so they had found that, you know, they could remap this to memory where they could write to it and control it. And so essentially they could, you know, write this and it would periodically be called whether or not there's a uh, whether or not AMT is enabled or not. And then at that point, they actually use BMA from within the chipset in order to reach out and touch the host OS and stuff like that. So this is another example where I said you get really low, but the problem is you, you go low in order to persist, in order to hide, you know, because people don't know how to detect you. But you still have to kind of come back up high in order to find the stuff you're trying to attack, right? It's all good and well to say, you know, I'm super low, we kit and I'm installed. But then what do you do at that point, right? Presumably, you still have some goal of you know, monitoring the system, stealing data, whatever you're trying to do. You still have to probably bounce back up to a higher level and do your actual goal. All right. So ring negative three detection. Right. So how do we detect this? Well, theoretically, you could be there first. So you could have another piece of code in the AMT code watching for this. And this is not entirely unreasonable because uh, the year before they talked about the AMT thing, Intel guy actually gave a presentation where he said, hey, you know those SMM rootkits? I know. I can fix that because I'll live in the North Bridge and we'll run a custom firmware in the North Bridge and then that'll be, you know, searching for SMM rootkits, verifying the SMM memory, right? 
So the question then is, you know, if this deep watch thing is already in SM, is already in the Northridge, and the attacker can get code in Northridge, you know, who wins, right? At some point, at some level, you always come down to a point where you can you can always keep playing the game of I'm just going to get one level lower than the attacker, and that's how I'll detect them. But the attackers keep seeming to be able to get down to those same low levels. So, you know, personally, my thought on this is that at some point you have to make a stand. And that's where this self-attestation technique comes in. So there's this thing called SWAT, which was the application to um, embedded devices, SVAP. I think SVAP was, if I'm remembering correctly, I really should go look that up. I think SVAP was actually the application to a keyboard. I'll talk about that in a second. And then there's another thing called Pioneer, which uh, the application to OS is. So self-attestation or software-based attestation All right, so self-attestation or software-based attestation is where actually code integrity checks itself. It reads all of its memory, checking its own memory in response to a query from an outside uh, source. And so you say, you know, some other source says, dear, uh, dear Northbridge, check thyself. It does a self-checksum, which is supposed to take some certain, based on the code that it uses to check itself, uh, it should take a discrete amount of time in order to read all of its code, go through however many looping iterations. And then it sends back a result to whoever asked for it, saying, you know, here's my state right now. And then, you know, it can go on to check the rest of the information. And so with self-attestation, it's sort of exploiting a uh, timing side channel. So when the, uh, when the verifier comes in and says, you know, dear Northbridge, please uh, tell me your state, it sends a query. It sends like a nonce so that there's a fresh, uh, fresh challenge. And then it gets back a result. So it's sent from the time in which it sends the query to the time it gets the result back, that time should be fairly uh, finite because there should only be so many CPU cycles in the number of iterations that that self-checking code should take. If an attacker comes in there and starts putting if conditionals in, where he's saying like, if you're trying to read my attacker code, then I'll give a clean copy back, that starts adding more instructions, which over the, you know, potentially millions or billions of iterations this thing is doing over its own code, those more instructions, you know, one extra instruction turns into a billion extra instructions if you're looping a billion times reading your own code. And therefore, that turns into you know, a billion times slowdown. So the uh, verifier can potentially see a difference. So uh, some people at CMU have applied this uh, to <coughs> interesting things. So SWAT was originally for like a PDA type device. So you got one PDA and you got another PDA and it wants to say, you know, is this still any good? Got the verifier over here. It says, you know, PDA, tell me if you're good. Sends back uh, the result. And then based on the timing, it can say whether that's any good or not. In the SVAP case, there was an attack again like two years ago or three years ago at Black Hat where someone said for the um, wireless keyboard for Macs, uh, the Apple wireless keyboard, it has a little uh, microcontroller in it. And someone reverse engineered that and showed how they could essentially insert a keystroke logger into the microcontroller of the Apple Bluetooth wireless keyboard. But in SBAP, I believe, if I'm not misremembering, uh, they applied the self-attestation. They put code in the microcontroller for the keyboard using the exact same technique that the attacker did. They put code in there, and then it basically verified itself, and it was able to show that when the attacker was present, uh, it had a different timing in terms of how long it took to verify itself. And then Pioneer was the application of the same technique to a full x86 uh, Windows, uh, Linux OS in that case. SOS, I think. All right. But anyways, mostly the point is your SOL on ring negative 3 detection. We're not aware of anyone using it, but similarly, we're not aware of anyone not using it because we're not looking, because it's catch 22, because, you know, I said I don't know of anyone using ring negative 1 in the wild. But who's looking for ring negative 1 in the wild that they could actually tell me if he was being used in the wild? No one's looking because no one's heard of it being used in the wild. So it's just catch 22. We don't look because we haven't heard of it. We haven't heard of it because we don't look. So, um, yeah. And also, I think a lot of this is also, for all this stuff, like ring made one and below, 
maybe ring negative one we could see in generic use, but the ring negative two and three and stuff like that. I think if someone's going to go to the level of effort to actually deploy these types of attacks, first of all, you start getting into hardware dependencies. So it's like, you know, if you want to reflash a BIOS, you need to know for that particular BIOS and that north bridge and that south bridge. These things get to becoming hardware specific and not generic across things. Uh, and so if you're going to go to the trouble of that, you're probably going to use it in a targeted attack, right? So Stuxnet plus plus, you're looking for some specific target of very high value. And uh, if you're going to develop it, you're going to only target those sort of systems. So even if someone had detectors, uh, they would need to be appropriate applied to, uh, to systems of high value in order to detect these types of things. All right. So that's it for this. Any questions on uh, this sort of taxonomy, type 1, type 0, type 2, things like that? Quick quiz. What was uh, type 1? How did we define type 1, you kids? Yep. Changes things that are supposed to remain static. Type 2? Changes things that are supposed to remain dynamic. Type 3? Outside. Outside the OS. Type 0? What? Zero. Is potentially user level. Hitting in plain sight. It's kind of hiding in plain sight type things. You're not changing anything about the system necessarily. You're on the system, right? In that sense, you've changed it by installing your files. But you're not like actually trying to manipulate the system to hide yourself. You're just getting there, hiding, blending it.